Hello friends, welcome to Mac Truck Bookstop. Mike here, and uh, today I'm going to talk about El Siglo de las Luces by Alejo Carpentier from Cuba, or in English, Explosion in a Cathedral, uh, which is actually quite a different title, literally, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, this book, for my Spanish-speaking friends, is Inolvidable, Increíble, no se puede perder. It's an unforgettable, incredible, uh, can't miss book, especially for those who like historical fiction, which I know isn't everybody. I mean, actually, if you don't like historical fiction at all, then you might not like this book at all, but I found it to be incredible. Um, it takes place starting at the beginning of the French Revolution, but we're in Cuba, we're in the Caribbean, and the whole book kind of uh, discusses or, or shows the effect of the French Revolution on the Caribbean uh, and follows a well it's hard to say who the main character is see we follow in the beginning three orphans um, uh, merchants they're well off they live in Cuba they're criollo so European uh, born well they're uh, I guess European blood as it were living in the Americas and um, Sophia is kind of the principal character we follow she is the um, the the girl of the three uh, the other two Carlos and Esteban Esteban is actually a cousin of Sophia and Carlos but they're all orphans and they all live together in this big house uh, until they receive a strange visitor this visitor is actually a historic figure uh, who at the young time that we, he first enters the story is a young man in Havana and he's um, a merchant and he's, he's an enigmatic figure. He plays with the children, has uh, uh, dinner with them, wine, and they read and their house is full of all of these instruments um, astronomical and nautical instruments, things like that, and this uh, this whole setting um, it, it doesn't really set you up for what's to come. This this Victor is actually a historical figure who um, goes on to uh, defeat an English blockade in the Caribbean and eventually pretty much takes over the island of Guadalupe or Guadalupe. Uh, which, look that up on a map to figure out where it is, it's, it's kind of on the arc of islands that arcs towards South America, I, f I forget if it has a specific name. Um, and he comes with freedom in one hand and uh, a guillotine in the other uh, on the boat. Um, this is after some time spent in France with Esteban, so we kind of pass from Sophia as the main character who is raising Esteban um, not raising, uh, uh, kind of um, helping Esteban through his illnesses as a child and um, is kind of his mother figure as well as his sister in a way um, until Victor and his uh, friend who is a uh, black doctor medicine man from Haiti um, actually uh, and this is I mentioned his color because this is of course shocking at the time um, uh, he actually saves Esteban, and Esteban goes with Victor to uh, France. And from this comes this whole, you know, they end up going back to the Caribbean and taking over Guadalupe and, and all that. So, back to Victor with a, uh, uh, a paper that will free all the slaves, a law that will free all the slaves in one hand, and a guillotine in the other. And so they arrive, and so begins a sort of uh, reign of terror in the island of Guadalupe. Now, this uh, this is about as far as I can go without um, really getting into long spoilers. But the the main essence of this story is obviously about revolution, and. Um, the uh, if you have ever felt at some time in your life a deep conviction for a political cause or 
uh, somebody, you've really admired somebody and they've kind of um, wrapped you up in their cause and you kind of end up really passionate about this cause but you're not sure if you're passionate about the cause or them um, uh, for their leadership and their charisma. Uh, I think many of us have felt something like this in our life but then at some point become very um, disappointed and let down and that's putting it lightly because I think this feeling of losing an ideal that you've had so long, whether it be a person or an actual political ideal, um, can be a really devastating thing in one's life, a really crushing and power, powerful change in life and uh, can actually bring out some very deep depression as well as other um, emotions. Uh, it, can be, it can be quite a radical thing. And that is where I connected so much with this book, and, and I found Esteban to be a great blank slate for me, because to, for me to insert myself into him and viewing these historical events transpire, uh, where, you know, Victor, Victor Hugo is the historical figure. He is so charismatic and, and brilliant. He defeats an English navy that, uh, and army that he had no business defeating um, and, and becomes this revolutionary leader, bringing freedom to an island. And uh, he's a very charismatic figure the first half of the book. You really like him. But then when the Reign of Terror hits, he, he changes, he changes, and, and there are many times in the book where even you think maybe you can justify it, you know, history isn't a straight line. There's a great conversation between Sofia and Esteban in the book about this. History isn't a straight line and, and all change in the world, um, there's tumult and all change in the world, there's bloodshed, there's things like this, it's required to change things, you can make that argument. Um, and many people have to mixed results in history. Um, and so this struggle that's at the heart of it, this disenchantment uh, with a political ideal or with a person, um, I found easy to relate with Esteban because Esteban is really kind of a moderate, more of a moderate thinker. He's more nuanced. He's not quite as much of a go-getter. He sits back and kind of watches the events happen. His main role in the revolution is as a translator. So he translates documents from French to Spanish and uh, helps distribute them. And for Victor Hugo, uh, and by the way, Victor Hugo is a, is a big fan of uh, Rob Spear. And Rob Spear is a character in the book, although distant. We never, I don't think we ever actually see him but he is mentioned very often and Victor Hugo is obviously a close confidant with him and a big fan of him so and Victor Hugo also sees a lot of himself in Robespierre um, so there's also this kind of um, in the book too like the guillotine really takes on a character it kind of reminded me back in high school when they made us read A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens where there was kind of this uh, the guillotine is described almost as like this um, pers a person or this like consuming um, but seductive figure um, a, a, almost like a yeah like a type of you know um, spirit or or something that just kind of takes hold of the town and it's described in the same way in this book um, and is of course becomes part of like the civilization of Guadeloupe in many of the in many of the ways that you see it in Paris, like where vendors will sell little uh, guillotine keychains, things like that, and um, uh, not keychains, but you know like woodcuts keychains. <laughs> keychains is too modern, uh, <laughs> but uh, the um, yeah the. Um, the, the just, that leads me to kind of the descriptions and the writing of this book, which is really the highlight. This book goes through so many different places. You know, we start in Cuba, we go to France, then to Guadeloupe, and then, oh, uh, Haiti on the way, uh, where, where there's this beautiful description of, of Haiti burning during the revolution, and it's kind of a precursor of what's to come. And then 
yeah, so we go to France, then Guadeloupe, and then Esteban, when he becomes disenchanted with the revolution, finds himself going to Suriname, to French Guiana, um, and then back to Cuba, and uh, eventually the story ends in Spain. And at this point, I'm going to just talk a little bit more loose, so if this book seems to interest you, which I do highly recommend it, actually, uh, I just saw Penguin Paperbacks is coming out with a, um, a new translation, I believe, or a new edition, whatever, of this book in September, so in English. So if it's hard to find in English right now, which I don't think it's too hard to find in English, Explosion in a Cathedral, not El Siglo de las Luces, um, I definitely recommend this. Uh, and I will also say, if you're concerned about the times or whatever, uh, it is very sympathetic to uh, the the um, the common person in this book, although that we don't really get too many individuals besides like that um, that Haitian doctor I mentioned, or um, maybe a few other examples. But really, the book is focused on observing these historical events. But yet, Esteban and Sofia are great blank slates for you as a wo as a man or a woman to kind of put yourself in and react to what's happening, and that's the point. Um, you, it might come off as really depressing, but in the spoiler section, I'm going to talk about why I don't think this is a depressing book, or doesn't need to be, and is actually really life-changing, and really makes um, uh, a really just brilliant take on this whole thing, besides just the amazing descriptions and vocabulary. All these places that we go in this book have beautiful, elaborate descriptions. The beautiful, elaborate descriptions of of the Caribbean Sea and you know the the fauna and flora and the towns and the cities. Um, this is some of the most incredible writing I have ever read in. Um, uh, well, particularly in Spanish. I really can't say how it translates to English, but the vocabulary is immense. It took, it's taken me um, many weeks to read this, and, and I had to spend these past five days only focusing on this book um, because it was, it really pushed the limits of my Spanish reading ability. Um, but wow, was it worth it. Uh, wow, wow, was it worth it. I mean, I couldn't, I could read um, that part uh, when they are in Haiti, uh, before I, I talk more about some of the other stuff, um, just to give you an idea of, uh, of what it's like. Well, it's really a beautiful day. As if my foot's falling asleep. I really got to be um, more prepared than this. Because <laughs> it's, uh, it's really beautiful writing. Oh, I should, I wanted to say too, a lot of the chapters start with, um, these names of sketches by Goya, I think they're sketches, but I looked them all up as I was going and that added to this sort of haunting nature of the book and gave you an image for each part as, uh, as you were going into it. Um, and, and the whole Goya thing was really, uh, that, that, that just added to the atmosphere. Um, I didn't even talk about the difference between the, the titles. So in, um, English, Explosion in a Cathedral refers to a painting that's mentioned many times in the book. I don't like that title as much because that painting is mentioned so many times, it's like, yeah, we get it, it's the title of the book. To me, it doesn't even make sense to have it as the title. El Siglo de las Luces actually means the Age of Enlightenment, or more literally, the Century of Lights. I love that title. Not only that's not just a great way to call the Age of Enlightenment or like very um, uh, evocative in its image, also relates to some of the other images in the book, but it's, um, 
it's it's a haunting title because really the book is asking about um, you know w was the revolution worth it did anything change and um, the reason I don't think that it's a depressing book is simply because well yes um, probably probably one of the most depressing parts of the book and here of course is a spoiler please go check out the book if you don't want spoilers but um, we we stop following Esteban Esteban for a while and we end up following Sofia as she joins Victor as he becomes governor of French Guyana this is after all the stuff that happened in Guadalupe very very late in the book um, so she meets him in French Guyana and um, they have a kind of romantic relationship. She's, she's very much uh, in love with him, it seems. And then um, she becomes disenchanted with him when suddenly he, by decree of Napoleon, uh, reinstates slavery. And so then she's asking, wait, didn't you show up in Guadalupe? Wasn't all your fame and um, power that you had in Guadalupe and all you achieved due to having the Declaration of Freedom of the Slaves in one hand? And he reproaches her, he doesn't listen. He really ends the book as kind of a, a sick and miserable man. Um, and you know, you as the reader, whether through the eyes of Esteban or Sofia, are disenchanted with him. Sofia is an incredible character. Um, she makes her own decisions, and I think that's part of what this El Siglo de las Luces, the Age of Enlightenment, um, one of the things that is indicated by this, um, this revolution and the revolutions that begin to happen um, throughout the world at this time is, you know, the liberation of women and, and for them to make their own choices, uh, not only for liberation of slaves, even though that takes a step back. But that's not, even, that's not even what makes this not depressing. Even though we've just had the most depressing part of the book where slavery is reinstituted in French Guyana, there's some horrific scenes, um, many, of, many of the slaves escape into the jungle, um, there's a hunt for them, and that's where, where Victor Hugo is... Um, uh, becomes sick and uh, and kind of is defeated um, it, we leave him defeated uh, but no it's when in the final moments of the book we're in Spain and um, there is an uprising in Madrid and this is going to kick off um, this is during the invasion, uh, Napoleon's invasion of Spain. My history on this is a bit rough, but all I know is we end this book in the moment that's going to kick off um, the, the toppling of the Spanish crown, or the replacement uh, by Napoleon of the Spanish crown, which is going to kick off all of the revolutions in South America um, that really is going to end slavery in most of those countries, even if that too takes some time and uh, is delayed. But again, this book, I think, if you're going to find hope in it, you just have to find, you have to rid yourself of the idea that one event there's a cause and effect for every event that we can control. One can fight, one can do something, one can have convictions. It may not lead to the results that one wants, and, and maybe we're all kind of part of some divine plan, or maybe not, or maybe we're, maybe this is chaos, but to go out, to do something, to put your intention into it. I think Sophia says it best at one point to, when she says she wants to leave French Guyana, she says something to the effect of, um, that she just wants to, she needs to be where um, the people, she, she can't be where people are waiting for nothing. So she, she has to be where, where people are expecting a better future or want a better future. She simply cannot live with this sort of acceptance of the way things are, that we just had these bloody revolutions and now we're just going to go back to the way things were. She cannot do that. Um, I hesitate to, to bring any of, of this into like modern day um, political thought, but I do think that a lot of it can really apply um, if you start to think about it and start to think about do I just want to be, you know, a passive observer in things and, and what um, do I want to, I guess, 
uh, be a part of? Um, where is my place in this? Am I an Esteban? Am I a Sophia? Or am I a Victor? And uh, Victor Hugh? And what does that mean? I mean, these are real. Um, well, Vic Victor Hugh is real. And you can look up, the, this is a little known historical figure that really had a major impact. And um, I think the final thing to uh, really take away from that, this isn't a depressing book. The explosion in a cathedral happened. A chain of, a chain of um, events was set off by all of this. It wasn't for nothing. It might not be, it might not be the chain of event that anyone intended or um, that uh, that anyone um, thought it would be that way, but something happened. Something happened, and it went somewhere. And there, there is a kind of um, comfort looking back on that historical moment now, knowing today that many things are better in much of the world, and um, even the South American revolutions, although. Latin America, you know, has had some some really rough uh, uh, history, just like the United States. I think all of us are a little bit better than we were during this time period. I would certainly rather live in this time period than that one. Who knows how long it'll last? I don't know. At this point, I'm just rambling. But um, these are kind of the feelings that this book all kicked up for me. And there's a lot more. It's it's really beautiful. Um, the writing, the characters, um, and it goes to show you don't need to write a book with these big internal worlds of the characters, or you don't have to like be na a narrating inside one character's twisted thoughts or or something to to really profoundly disturb the waters of somebody in a book. Uh, what Alejo Carpentier accomplished in this is incredible, and also the fact that this came out. Um, very close. Uh, 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 he wrote this just after the Cuban Revolution, and it came out in Cuba, and was successful in Cuba, and quite um, accepted and enjoyed. So it um, it's not like it was seen as subversive or anything, which I find really fascinating, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, yeah, so uh, that was... Alejo Carpentier's El Siglo de las Luces. I feel like there's more I want to say, but it'll happen someday when I'm, uh, I guess, uh, after I've read more and, and have a little bit more background. This book, apparently, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was in the middle of writing A Hundred Years of Solitude when he read this book, and when he read it, he had to basically rip it all up and start over. So that's kind of what initially attracted me to reading this book, as well as seeing it on the list of um, Cuba's greatest novels. And um, reading the synopsis then, of course, got me hooked and really made me want to see it. And I don't think I have anything else planned, or I might not read anything else that brings this much light into how the French Revolution really affected um, the Caribbean, Latin America, much more so than the American Revolution, and yeah, yeah, very fascinating, uh, as well as emotionally impactful and, and beautiful, and beautiful. So thank you again for watching. I hope you will join me on the next episode of Reading the World. Um, not sure which country it's going to be yet, uh, but yeah, thanks, thanks for watching. Take care. The Solas Venian del Sur quietas, acompasadas, tejiendo y destejiendo el tejido de sus espumas delgadas, semejantes a las nerveduras de un marmol oscuro. Atrás habían quedado los verdes de las costas, navegábase ahora en aguas de un azul tan profundo que parecían hechas de una materia en fusión, aunque hibernal y vidriosa, movidos por un palpito muy remoto. No se dibujaban criaturas en aquel mar entero, cerrado sobre sus fondos de montañas y abismos como el primer mar de la creación, anterior al Murice y al Argonauta. Solo el Caribe, pululante de existencias, sin embargo, cobraba a veces un tal aspecto de océano deshabitado. 
como urgidos por un misterioso menester, los peces huían de la superficie, hundíanse las medusas, desaparecían los sargazos, quedando solamente frente al hombre lo que traducía en valores de infinito, el siempre aplazado deslinde del horizonte, el espacio y más allá del espacio, las estrellas presentes en un cielo cuyo mero enunciado verbal recobraba la aplastante majestad que tuviera la palabra, alguna vez para quienes la inventaron, acaso la primera inventada después de las que apenas empezaban a definir el dolor, el miedo o el hambre. Aquí sobre un mar yermo el cielo cobraba un peso enorme, con aquellas constelaciones vistas desde siempre que el ser humano había ido aislando y nombrando a través de los siglos, proyectando sus propios mitos en lo inalcanzable, ajustando las posiciones de las estrellas al contorno de las figuras que poblan sus ocurrencias de perpetuo inventor de fábulas. Yeah, this book is a love letter to the Caribbean. <laughs>